Hi folks, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and in this video we're going to look at some nonlinear elements that are really common in dynamic system control design. Now you might be asking yourself, since this is a series on linear control, what are we doing with nonlinear dynamic systems? It turns out there's some things you can do with linear analysis techniques to analyze the behavior of nonlinear systems. And also there are some common nonlinearities that you can simulate, again, using some ideas from linear analysis. So we'll just look at a couple of those that are real common. Most physical systems have nonlinears associated with them. We might model those as linear just so that we can do some control design or some rough analysis, but in the end, there are almost always some nonlinearities. And one of them is Coulomb friction. Another one is actuator effort limiting, and we'll take a look at both of these in the rest of this video. When we're done, you should be able to recognize the structure of these types of nonlinear. By the time we're done, you should be able to recognize the structure of these types of nonlinearities and actually explore how they might respond via simulation and see how you can use some linear ideas to analyze these types of systems. I'm going to do this by example, and the first thing we'll look at is Coulomb damping. So imagine you have this dynamic system in equation one, and there's two damping elements. There's the viscous term, the three y dot, a beautiful linear phenomenon, and then there's the Coulomb term, which is C, some constant, times signum, where its argument is y dot, and that is definitely a nonlinear phenomenon. Because we have a nonlinearity in this equation, we can't really apply Laplace transform techniques to it. But we can do some tricks with it so that we can analyze this using some linear ideas like transfer function in simulation. The first thing we'll do is take the nonlinear term and just replace it with FC. Here's what the signum function looks like. It just simply takes on one of two values, either c or negative c. Now I've shown it here for a particular value of c equals two. Notice that the argument to that function is y dot. So if y dot is greater than zero, it takes on the value of c, or in this case two. And if y dot is less than zero, it takes on the value of negative c, or negative two. Now let's take equation two and express it via a Laplace transform, where we treat FC just like it's some other input. So that's shown in equation three, and notice the negative sign because I flipped FC to the right-hand side of that uh, equal sign. The Laplace transform of y double dot plus three y dot plus five y is just s squared plus three s plus five, and so that's the denominator in those two functions, the one in front of the u and the one in front of the fc. Now let's draw this as a block diagram. We take u, multiply it by seven, and then subtract from it fc. The, the combination of those two things goes into the input of the transfer function one over s squared plus three s plus five. And then the only thing we have to do is get into the feedback path, that crazy nonlinearity. And we can do that by just differentiating y, so we get y dot, passing it through a signum function, and then multiplying it by c. And voila, we have a beautiful Coulomb damping simulation where most of the simulation looks linear. So we'll have a look at this in Simulink in just a second. This is the block diagram I'll pull up in Simulink. And you can see it has the same basic structure as the block diagram we just looked at. Now I used a hysteresis block in Simulink and just set the, uh, the hysteresis gap to be very, very, very tiny. So here's Simulink. I will find the model. Here it is. Let me shuffle this around a bit. And I have all the values of the model hard-coded into it, so I don't have to run any scripts or anything like that. And let's just take a look at it from left to right. I'm putting in here a step input of amplitude one. It occurs at time equals zero, that's pretty boring. Here's the multiplication by seven that we saw in the previous block diagram. Our beautiful Coulomb damping 
expression. This is the DDT of Y, so we get Y dot. Here's the hysteresis block or the relay block, and it has very, very tiny values for when it switches on and off, basically zero. And here's the output, one and negative one. And then just multiplying that by 0.6 and subtracting it off. Now here's the plant without any Coulomb damping in it. So one way to think of this is that let's say you have a dynamic system and it has some viscous damping, 3y dot, and you think it has a little bit of Coulomb damping, and so you might model it with just this plant. But if you wanted to explore the effect that the Coulomb damping would have, even though you think it's small, you could put it in by just doing a trick like this. And then evaluating in the simulation the effect of that little Coulomb damping. All right, enough yakking, let's run this thing. I'm logging some data. So let's have a peek at that. I'll move this out of the way for a moment. I have Y and Y and C for, um, I don't know, without the Coulomb damping, I guess. No Coulomb, there we go. So here's Y. That's with a little bit of Coulomb damping, you know, 0.6. And here's YNC. So the green is the plant without any Coulomb damping. This is what we would have predicted if we wanted to ignore that little bit of Coulomb damping. But look at the effect that the Coulomb damping has. It really just annihilates that uh, response. Now yeah, let's fiddle around with this a little bit more. Now if the if everything is good, if I set this Coulomb damping to be a very small number, then we should see both of the responses look pretty much the same. That's always a good thing to check. And if we make the Coulomb damping large, let's see, I had it as 0.6 before, I'll just make it 1. It's large in a sense. Then we get more of this kind of annihilated response, this overdamped response, is actually creeping up to a steady state value very slowly. You might not want that, or at least you might want to know that it's going to happen. All right, so now let's go back to the notes and take a look at a different nonlinearity. The next one we'll look at is really important. It gets you in almost every control system design. It's called effort limiting. Basically, it's capturing the fact that no matter what kind of actuator you have, at the end of the day, it's going to saturate. You can't get infinite whatever out of it, whether it's force or torque, etc. And if you include it in your analysis, you've now taken a linear system, perhaps, and turned it into a nonlinear system. What's really interesting is that we can use linear analysis techniques to actually approximate or estimate what sort of response we might get. And what we call the kind of response that we can get sometimes without limiting is a limit cycle. The output sits there and oscillates like a sine wave. And what we can do with linear analysis is predict its frequency of oscillation and its amplitude, and whether or not that limit cycle will be stable or not. Now I guess a lot of times what we do is we assume that we're going to be gentle with the controller so that we never hit the limits of saturation with the actuator. Put another way, you could say I need to get a bigger motor or bigger uh, hydraulic cylinder to get the sort of output that I need without saturating. So we'll take a look at this effort limiting a little bit in um, analysis and then head into Simulink. Here's the plant that we'll use. It's a third order plant. It has a couple of poles at negative one and then a pole at the origin. And we'll put in an effort limiting block or phenomenon that looks like the one shown here. And then we have a gain K. Now this gain K has a couple different uh, roles. It is a proportional gain. Notice we have unity feedback, so you can think of it as a proportional controller. But it also affects our saturation value. Here I've shown the saturation value at 1 and negative 1, but when we multiply it by k, of course, that changes the, the upper limit and the lower limit. Now if you don't have saturation in here, we can easily show that for k less than 2, the system is stable. It has a nice, relatively nice response. And that's true actually if we have saturation also. And the reason is, is because, like I mentioned before, the control effort will always be below the saturation level. Now if we go back to the case where we don't have any effort limiting again, 
If k is greater than 2, the system is unstable and the output grows without bound. But if we do have saturation in the system, it's a completely different story. For k greater than 2, the response does not grow without bound. It has some sinusoidal response, and we can actually estimate that frequency of the sine wave, in this case 1 radian per second, and the amplitude of the error signal, the difference between u and y. For example, if we set k equal to 3, the amplitude of the error signal is 1.8, for 4, 2.5, for 5, 3.1. And we can estimate all of those things just with linear analysis techniques. So here's what we're going to look at in Simulink. It's just two models again, with one having a saturation or effort limiting block in it, and the other one with no effort limiting. And we'll compare the results. Okay, let's look at this model. Let me move it around a bit, make it bigger so we can all see it. I'm hitting it with a step input of amplitude 1, and I've got the effort limiting set to 1 minus 1. I can go into the block and have a peek, and you can see that there. And here's my gain k, so I have it set to 3. Let's set this down to um, 1.5. Right, because if we set it to 1.5, the response should be stable. And so we'll just double check that. And I'm also printing out or logging here eSat. So that is the value right after the saturation block. Let's run this and have a look in the data inspector. And what shall we look at? How about Y and Y and S? Well, they're exactly the same. And that's because if we were to look at eSat, we would see that it's not saturating. It's only going up to almost 1, but not quite. So it's not saturating yet. Beautiful. Now, let's crank this up to, well, let's say 2.1. Now at 2.1, the system without saturation should go bonkers. It should go unstable. Let's have a look. And I'm going to clean this up just a little bit. Here's Y and Y without saturation. And I'll go to full screen. And we can see that the blue one, which is no saturation, is starting to grow without bound. The orange one, on the other hand, with saturation, is staying bounded. It has this nice sine wave, but it's bounded. Very nice. Now, let's go to a different value of k. I'm going to pick one that I remember. So if I pick 4, if you recall on the slides, the predicted error amplitude was 2.5. Again, I didn't actually go through the math on the slides. We'll do that in another video. But you can do it. And let's see what we get. Uh, that was some freaky thing from uh, the data inspector. So let's look at how about, well, why no saturation should grow without bound because the, the gain is greater than 2. That's nothing new. But let's take a look at why. There's a beautiful looking sine wave. This is a limit cycle, classic limit cycle. And if we were to look at the um, period of this, we would find it to be one radian per second. And again, we can predict that with linear um, analysis techniques. Now let's take a look at error. And remember on the slide, I said that for this value of k, it should be 2.5, and there it is. I'll put a cursor on there just so we can look at that, 2.5. That is some sweet action or what? So, and we can, again, predict all that just with, not quite back of the envelope, but pretty close, um, linear control analysis techniques. In summary, I just wanted to show you a couple different nonlinearities that are real common in control system analysis. And you can simulate them, especially the um, Coulomb damping is real easy to simulate. Even though it looks like, and it is, a nonlinear term, we can form a transfer function and put together a nice simulation. The effort limiting is completely analyzable, if that's a word, using linear analysis techniques, and we can predict all sorts of goodies, limit cycle, frequency, amplitude, etc. So that's it. Hope that helps. Bye-bye.